Tomorrow, the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Women and Girls will hold its first community hearing of 2018. Nearly 600 families and survivors have already told their stories since the commission began, and 600 more are registered to do so before the inquiry's full report this November. Louisa Lafferty is among 30 witnesses set to testify in Yellowknife this week. She'll do so in private to avoid a possible impact on the appeal of her daughter's convicted killer. Ahead of that hearing on Thursday, Lafferty spoke with our Briar Stewart about her hurt, her hope, and the struggle to heal. How am I going to accept it? How am I going to deal with it? I wouldn't want any other mother to ever go through this. The pain in your body just takes over. In Fort Good Hope, there's only a few hours of precious light. And digging out is a necessary routine. Part of that means coming here for what has become a somber ritual for Louisa Lafferty and her family. Every weekend, she comes to the cemetery to clear off her daughter's grave and take a moment to reflect never seems to get any easier. I want to put somebody picking up somebody around the old folk duplex outside. The old folks duplex? Who is being assaulted? This is a call made by an elder to the police on the morning of March 22nd, 2014. By the time police arrived, it was too late. A young woman had been beaten to death. And in this Denny community of just over 500, the news traveled quickly. So then he got up and... Lafferty heard about it from her husband. And he woke me up, he said, um, something happened to somebody outside that senior citizen's home. I said, what? He said, I don't know, there's somebody laying there. It's like, oh my God. And then I went to Charlotte's room. She was right at the last room. I went there to tell her, you know, get up now. Something happened and whatever. And oh my God. My stomach just totally dropped. <laughs> the twins were in there alone. 23-year-old Charlotte Lafferty was a single mother. She had recently stopped going to school because it became too much with her two-year-old twins. Witnesses testified that she had gone out with friends and spent the night drinking at different houses. And that's where her mother started searching for her desperately. I just went everywhere. Everywhere that I thought they would be drinking or if they would be hiding her. Hours later, police photographs confirmed her worst fears. All the stuff I bought her was all on those pictures. Right when I seen the shoes, I knew it was her. Keenan McNeely was charged and convicted of first degree murder in Charlotte's death. He was 17 at the time, but was sentenced as an adult. Court heard that Charlotte was viciously beaten with a piece of lumber sexually assaulted, urinated on, and left to die in the snow. The murder and trial divided Fort Good Hope. Well, go in the, in the <laughs> Roger Plouffe witnessed that firsthand. He helps lead the Catholic mission here. He says both the victim and the convicted killer have large families, and the crime tore the tight-knit community apart. When there is any kind of event, Everybody knows about it, but when it's a violent event and when it's a sad and there's a death involved, you can actually feel the entire community. The pain is just evident in everywhere. Ploof says he was drawn to Fort Good Hope because of how open and friendly people are. But Charlotte's death was a brutally harsh reminder of the community's darker struggles. A monument now stands at the spot where she was killed. What kind of impact is her death and that really violent incident having on this community? 
it continues to ask the question about what violence is about and where it's coming from and, and, and how, I guess alcohol is always involved in most of these situations, so where is that coming from? The amount of alcohol is restricted here, but bootlegging is prevalent. Drinking is seen as a source of many of the problems and also a way to deal with them. He said that's why they, they cry so much. Charlotte's grandparents have lived here for more than seven decades. Speaking in the Slavey language, Gabriel Cochon describes the change he's seen. His son Rudolf translates. <laughs> Everybody's hurting about what happened. Everybody's saying that this community is re a really big change. And there's a lot of drinking going on, and there, there's drugs in that in town. Everybody's drifting apart. Grandpa's cooking chicken. Today, Lafferty is trying to hold her family together. She frequently takes care of her grandchildren. The twin boys are too young to have memories of their mother, Charlotte, but the reminders of her are everywhere. So over here, these are all pictures of all Charlotte? All pictures of Charlotte. There's me, her dad, when she was a baby, the doctor that delivered the twins. Some people like it thin. Lafferty's house is almost always full and there are plenty of meals to prepare. We're the type of people that grew up on the land, so we need our meat and fish. But she admits that she spent much of the past four years alone in her room, a time she even considered killing herself. I did a lot of drinking, lots. I had to kill that pain. And when I wasn't drinking, I just stayed in my room. She now goes to see a counselor in Inuvik. It's helped, but the pain is still searing. The lingering effects of trauma can be felt throughout this community. Posters designed to uplift and inspire have been lovingly placed after a rash of violence and a suicide here. The grief and the pain is all coming back, especially after just death after death around the community. I don't even go to the funeral services anymore. It's too painful. Like pain, so much pain, Briar. It feels like your heart's gonna explode. On a bitterly cold night, some from the community come together to remember. Charlotte is still trying to tell us to live life positively and to become comfortable with each other and eventually friends again, especially for those who are still feeling guilt and do not know how to overcome those feelings. Lafferty is trying to gather up her strength because she's getting ready to testify at the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. It's like you have to tell your story so they could hear it, so this don't happen to somebody else. She wants to talk about the justice system and the lack of support in smaller communities, but above all, she just wants the chance to talk about Charlotte. When you gather like this and your family and friends come around you, it uplifts you, you just you feel not alone. For the community, it offers a sense of hope when the loss of the past still seems so overwhelming. And it helps to steady Lafferty as she prepares to tell her daughter's story one more time. Oh, God! Briar Stewart, CBC News, Fort Good Hope in the Northwest Territories.